So you've heard me talk before in the past about <clears throat> where we're at. I consider the Redwood Church of God through what God has revealed to be an end times church. God is calling us to understand the time and the season that we're in. And in that place, I talked about envy, I talked about deception, and today I'm going to talk about hate. Not so much of what is in us, but what we're going to encounter. Have you ever been in a place where someone has really hated you? Many of us can understand that. But the Bible says a lot about hate. I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Why? We're just a bunch of loving people that want to do good works, that want to spray, spread the joy of the Lord and watch him bless people. Why is the world going to hate us for that? And what's the purpose of this hate? And what's behind this hate? That's the word of the Lord. That's what we're going to talk about today. And the other thing we're going to talk about is, are you prepared to face this? Because as, as we go along, it's going to increase. We're just now beginning to see. I know I heard, um, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but this, the United States used to be considered a Christian um, country. And... Uh, I heard it's like 42% now Christian. I don't know how accurate that is, but it makes a lot of sense. And this is something that we're going to have to face and deal with. Look at that face. There's hate there. And there's evil there for not a cause. We're going to talk about that. Brother Miles. Do you have a mic? We have a mic. Okay. Um, do you have a weather report? The Weather Center forecast for the Redwood Church of God. Look for the sun to be in the hearts of believers. Whether it's raining, snowing, hailing, the wind is against us, the sun is always warming us from our heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Give me a hand. That's a gift. So when the world comes against you, and me, and the church, can you endure it? Matthew 24, 8. Yeah, hold up a second. And what I mean by endure it, have you ever been the object of hate? Yeah. By groups of people, maybe? Maybe by the, the majority? That's a difficult place to stand. And the things that the world is saying about Christians and about our faith, to them it makes a lot of sense. Well, Christians are like this, or Christians are like that, blah, 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 blah. And we can listen to that, and we can get in a place to where, I'm just going to be quiet. I don't want to speak about Jesus. Because if I do, I'm going to trigger this hate this condemnation, this judgment that's coming against us. Go ahead and read. Matthew 24, 8. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. What are birth pains? <laughs> well, if you've ever been married and have had children, you should know too. Yeah. When they first come, is there, do they all come in, in, okay, I'll just say it. We all know they come, 
and then there's a period of time, then they come again, then they come again, and they get closer and closer and closer together. Amen? Yes, Sean. It is the delivery of the church. So, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. So the things that we're seeing now is a foreshadow. They're going to start happening more and more and be more frequent. Go ahead, brother. Merely the beginning of birth pains, the intolerable anguish, and the time of unprecedented trouble. Do we know what the unprecedented trouble is that Jesus is referring to here? Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. Verse 9. Before the Great Tribulation is going to be called the beginning of sorrows or birth pangs. But even before that, before a w when a woman is pregnant, she's got a really big stomach. And you know she's pregnant. Even though she hasn't exper experienced any birth pangs yet. That's where we're at as far as is at the end times. We can see, we can discern the time. We know that the end is near. The return of Christ is near. Amen? Amen. And it's not anything that we should fear, but it's something that we need to be prepared for. Because the hate's going to come against us for one reason. So you'll fall away. So you'll fall away. And there's a, there's a, um, in the Bible, I think it continues to go on. Continue to read that. Then they will hand you over to endure tribulation and will put you to death. And you will be hated by all the nations because of my name. Because of who? The name of Jesus. Wow. Are you prepared? If we happen to be here and this happens to us, are you prepared? How are you going to get through it? Are you going to lay down? Or are you going to stand up? Knowing what's going to come your way. Yes, Danielle. Even though the Great Tribulation is the, the Great Tribulation, and that's the birth pangs, when a woman is pregnant, from the very beginning, she begins a process of growth and development that grows in increasing discomfort, little by little, little by little. And she has to do unique and creative ways to make herself comfortable to allow that child to grow. Okay, thank you. The Great Tribulation, just so I'll review it for everyone, is the last three and a half years. The tribulation is a period of seven years. The first three and a half years are not going to be anything like the last three and a half. And so um, the birth pangs is called, or another, the Bible also calls it the beginning of sorrows. It's actually went at the start of the tribulation period, according to Scripture. We're not there yet. But we can certainly see what's on its way. It's getting more and more uncomfortable. You're right. <clears throat> okay, brother, I'm sorry. Verse 10. At that time, many will be offended and repelled by the association with me. By their association with me. Okay. And will fall away. So that's talking about, quote, believers. Oh, I'm a Christian. Really? I hate you. This and this and this and this. And they're going to be offended. And they won't have the endurance to stand up, and they're going to fall away. Are you prepared? Are you prepared to come under that if you happen to be here? Are you, are you prepared to give your life for Christ? Pastor James, why are you talking about that? I don't hear a thing about that. Well, there's no guarantee for any of us. The Bible is not specific when the rapture is coming. I believe it's coming before the beginning of the tribulation period. But in case it doesn't, what am I going to do? Am I prepared? Or even if it gets really nasty before the tribulation comes, and I'm faced with these circumstances, am I going to be able to endure all of the hate and the negativity 
and the persecution and the slander and the discomfort and all of the things. Maybe they'll come in here and shut down this church. Okay, we'll just all fall away, right? No. House church. Yeah, we'll go underground. We'll do what we have to do. We are the family of God. Amen. Go ahead. Now check this last part out. This is, who's talking here? Jesus, red letters. This is the Lord telling us. Verse 10. At that time, many will be offended and repelled by their association with me and will fall away from the one uh -huh. whom they should trust yeah. and will betray one another, handing over believers to their persecutors and will hate one another. Look around. Go ahead. Disciples, relation to the world. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, and it does, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Amen. Amen. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, and would treat you with affection. But you are not of the world. You no longer belong to it. But I have chosen you out of the world. Hallelujah. And because of this, the world hates you. Remember, and continue to remember that I told you, a servant is no greater than his master. Isn't that just like a dumb sheep? Uh, remember and continue to remember. When the heat comes on you, remember. When the, when the persecution comes your way, or when the slander comes your way, or when the mocking comes your way, or when the discomfort comes your way, remember and continue to remember. That I told you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these hurtful things to you for my name's sake, because you bear my name and are identified with me. For they do not know the one who sent me. They do not know God. That's right. They do not know God. They need to know God, but what? they don't. They might say they do. People can say anything. But when you, when you start to experience and when we start to see this happening, don't listen to their words because they don't know God. What's wrong with bearing the name of Jesus Christ anyway? What is the character of Christ? Is God not love? Amen. Is he not good? That's right. Is it not, when we bear his name, don't we do things in his name that are good things to help people? Yes, we do. Well, why in the world do they hate him? They're jealous. Jealous? Think. Think about this. Why does the world hate Jesus? Jesus is good. Amen. There's, there's no, just think about it. There's, there's no reason that we can conjure up in our hearts and in our minds and um, why legitimately the world should hate Jesus. My God, he, he even came and gave his life for us. In, a, in such a gruesome way, endured such suffering, did miracles, Amen. healed people, loved people, set people free. That's right. Why well, hate Jesus? Let's go back to the beginning. 
John 1 1. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God Himself. Amen. Amen. He was continually existing in the beginning, uh -huh. co eternally with God. Amen. Amen. All things were made and came into existence through him, and without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. In him was life. Was what? Life. Wait a minute. I, I already have life. In him was life. What's this talking about? Keep reading. And the power to bestow life. And the life was the light of men. Was the what? The light of men. Light. Light. He was the light of Amen. men. What's the purpose of light? Cast the darkness away. Okay. The light shines on in the darkness. And the darkness did not understand it, or overpower it, or appropriate it, or absorb it, and is unreceptive to it. Are you with me? Amen. About the light and about darkness. You know, there's physical light and physical darkness. That's not what this is talking about. This is spiritual light and spiritual darkness. Come on. Have you ever been in spiritual darkness? Raise your hand. That's it? Okay. I, I think every hand should be up. Because before you knew Jesus, you were in darkness. Come on. That's right. Don't ever think that you weren't. Because you were. Maybe you're still there. And you haven't seen the light yet. Then your hand would stay down. But if you've actually been saved and, and the Holy Spirit is living within you, you've been in darkness and now you're in the light. That's right. And what does that mean? Life. What does life mean? If you're dead, you can be physically walking around and be dead. It just simply means spiritual death. And if you know life... That means what? You've been born again. You've been born from above. And you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and now you're alive to God instead of being dead to God. Excuse me for getting excited. So the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it and was unreceptive to it. Isn't that true, church? How many times have you brought the gospel? And, or how, how, how many times have you let the light shine through you and then people hate you and reject you? What does the light do? It exposes things. It gives people the ability to see things. That's right. And you know what? Whatever is hidden in the dark is ugly. And no one wants to see it, let alone have you shine your light into it. That's right. Why? Light. Does light what does what? Brings judgment. Does it? Uh-huh. Come on, brother. John 319. This is the judgment that is the cause for indictment. The test by which people are judged. The basis for the sentence. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light, but shrinks from it for fear that his sin, worthlessness activities will be exposed and condemned. But Who, whoever, who's ever been condemned before? Mm. You ever sit before a judge? Oh, boy. Boom. You, you're condemned. You've been judged. So don't be bringing that light on me. But that's the way the world thinks. Mm -hmm. That's what sin will do to you. Mm -hmm. Sin wants to remain in the darkness. 
If you're not born again, you can't comprehend what this is about. But when you've been born from above, you receive um, a new nature. That's right. A nature that is the nature of God. We are partakers in His divine nature. And now, because we've been born again, we desire the things of God, and yeah, let the light shine. Thank you, Lord. I was lost, but now I'm thin found. That's right. I can see. I understand. I was deceived. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Your sin does not want to be found out. There's even some Christians that are content to hide in sin with no conviction. Maybe they're the ones that are going to be falling away. How can you live in sin and have sin in your life and not be convicted about it and say you're a born-again believer? There has to be something going on in you which, because you can recognize that darkness. Not that you should be perfect, but you should not be satisfied or content to harbor that darkness in your life. You, you could be calling, I'm sorry, God, forgive me. I did it again. Okay. I'll confess the blood, and I'll get cleansed, and I'll get right before God, and I'll get back in right relationship to Him, and then here comes my flesh man again, or the devil, or whatever, coming along with the temptation, and dock on it, I fell for it again. Does that mean that you're not saved? No. It means you're weak. But if you don't want to expose your sin, if you don't want to repent of it, you don't want to walk away from it, because you know it doesn't please God, you got a problem. I love you, church, and I want you to know the truth. No one here is judging anyone, but I don't want you to stand, any of us to stand in a place of deception and deceit and ignorance, being, being here, and, and maybe, maybe you aren't saved. I don't know. Any, anybody can say they're saved doesn't mean they are. Maybe you haven't had a genuine conversion. That's where you need to start. On your face, repenting of you. See, you, in order to be saved, you have to realize you're a sinner. That you have sin. And you're not happy about that. And you want to get rid of it. And so you can see the need for Christ. If you don't see your sin, then you have no need for Christ. Christ. Why did, why did Jesus come? To save us, to take away the sin of the world. Amen. But men love sin. They don't want to give it up. I want to hang on to this. I want to live. Uh, I want to live a fake life. But when no one's looking, I'm hanging on to this because my flesh really loves it, and I'm not willing to give it up for God or anybody else. I'm just being real. Verse 20, for every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light, but shrinks from it for fear that his sinful, worthless activities will be exposed and condemned. But whoever practices truth and does what is right morally, ethically, spiritually comes to the light so that his works may be plainly shown to be what they are accomplished in God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, in dependence. We are so dependent upon God. On Him. Without Him, there's no way. There is no way. For every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light, but shrinks from it for fear that his sinful, worthless activities will be exposed and condemned. I remember, I remember back in my days when I'd be running and gunning for days on end, doing, doing all my foolishness. I used to hate it when the sun came up. I wanted it to be night all the time. I wanted to be in that darkness. I hated the sun. 
Sun came up, it was time to sleep. Sun goes down, it's time to go party or do whatever I was interested in doing. See that girl? Oh no, the sun's up. The light's in me. I gotta hide. Two, show me. Okay. The guilt of sin, John 15, 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have the guilt of their sin. But now, they have no excuse for their sin. The Amen. One Jesus brought the truth. He brought the light. Without that, they wouldn't, we wouldn't know that there was sin unless we had light. The one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done among them the works attesting miracles, which no one else ever did, they would not have the guilt of their sin. But now the fact is that they both have seen these works and have hated me and continue to hate me and my father as well. But this is so that the word which has been written in their law would be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. They without a hated cause. me without a cause. Just simply because God was good and sin is evil. The world does not hate its own. Go ahead. John 7, 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but any time is right for you. The world cannot hate you since you are part of it. But it does hate me because I denounce it and testify that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I'm not going up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Have you ever been drawn to an activity that you know you shouldn't participate in? Oh, boy. Yeah. Discern the God of this world. Who is the God of this world? You don't have to answer, but many Satan. of us already know. But I want to bring this out just so you can see it in Scripture. Go ahead. 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, since we have this ministry, just as we have received mercy from God, granting us salvation, opportunities, and blessings, we do not get discouraged nor lose our motivation. Stop. You see that? We Discouragement will come knocking on our door. It can even affect our motivation. I'm discouraged. I don't feel like doing that today. I don't feel like coming to church. I don't feel like calling this person and talking to them and doing whatever God has asked us to do because I'm discouraged. Continue. We do not get discouraged nor lose our motivation, but we have renounced the disgraceful things hidden because of shame. I renounce. I declare and decree I have no part with that. Amen. I do not like it. I have nothing to do with it. I renounce it. Get away from me. I'm going the opposite direction. That's right. Renounce it. Whatever it is, let it, let it be spoken. Renounce it. Get your mind set. Get your spirit set. I'm done with that sin. You know, a lot of churches you go to, you won't hear uh, a lot of preaching about sin. Well, I'm sorry. The truth we all true. deal with it. We all face it. Just because you don't talk about it, you know what? I'm sorry. If, if, if me talking about sin offends you and you don't want to come back again, that's on you. I'll just give you to the Lord. But we need to talk about this because sin is not judgment, not in the church. If there's any one of you that um, thinks that they're, they're, they don't sin, 
He better open up that word. Renounce the disgraceful things hidden because of shame. Not walking in trickery or adulterating the word of God, but by stating the truth openly and plainly. We commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is, in some sense, hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only to those who are perishing. Among them, the God of this okay. world. The God, is that a big G or a little G? Little G. So what does that mean? He's just a little God. <laughs> so if, if it was a capital G, what would it mean? Oh, my Lord. Okay. It would mean divinity. That's right. Go ahead. Among them, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, yeah. who is the image of God. See the, heading, see the heading up there? Discern. We have to understand this, that the God of this world has blinded the minds from the light. And that doesn't mean anything other than don't be discouraged. Don't be turned away. The love of God breaks down all barriers. But use discernment, understanding where the unbelievers are. And let the Holy Spirit guide you and speak through you in a manner that that darkness can be pierced by the light of the Word. That's right. And as your eyes were opened, so will theirs. Keep uh -oh. your vow with God. Do you know you guys have made a vow? Do you know that? What is a vow? Verbal contract. Go ahead, read. Yes, I promise. Exactly. Go ahead, Miles. James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses. Okay. Some versions say you adulterers and adulteresses. But I like this one. You know why? Thank you. We're Did you hear that? He said we're Be the bride of Christ. Because we're the bride. That's a feminine place. Don't get hung up on masculine and feminine. Doesn't mean anything. Don't get homophobic or anything like that. Okay? But we're the bride. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus. You're married to Christ. We've been betrothed to Christ. And in that place, are you going to cheat? If you're married in, in the physical, are you going to cheat on your partner? That's what adultery is. You're either an adulterer or adulteresses, or you both are. So here, James is saying, right off the bat, you adulteresses, you cheaters, you've married to the Lord, you're married to God, you've been betrothed. He's away preparing a place for you, and he's asked you to be set apart from the world. Who's the God of the world? Satan. So you want to have a uh, uh, an affair with Satan when you be thrown to the king a glory come on church continue you adulteresses disloyal sinners flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God yeah yeah did you understand that if you put anything above God out of this world you're committing spiritual adultery. And you're breaking your vow. And it hurts our bridegroom. Just like it would hurt you if your mate, your wife, or your husband went running around with some dude or some girl behind your back while you're out at work building a home and doing whatever or doing whatever for your home, for your family and everything, so he can present you 
something that's spotless and beautiful. And all he's asking you is to be set apart. Just set apart and wait for me. Do the things like I told you to do. I'm going to bless you. I've given you the comforter. I've given you the ability, the strength. I've given you my word. Just honor me and wait to see what happens when I come back for you. We're married. We're just not under, living under the same roof. But I go away and prepare a place for you. So I can get you and bring you with me. And we'll be together forever. That's right. And you can't wait five minutes. You have to go and do what you always used to do. You got to dabble in that darkness over there or this or that or whatever. Or put this above me and put that above me. I'm your husband. I'm your bridegroom. I love you. I, I suffered for you in a, in a manner in which that you can't even comprehend. And then you're going to go run around behind my back with the things of the world? You adulteresses. That's what James is telling us. We're cheaters. See, Jesus is our Lord, and he is our Savior. What does Lord mean? Master. Some people call him boss, which is fine. He's our Savior. He saved us. That's right. But he's also our bridegroom. Get intimate with your bridegroom, church. Get intimate with Christ. He's empowered us to do that by his blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we're now enabled to have intimate personal relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's right. Go ahead. Flirting with the world and breaking your vow to God. Do you not know that being the world's friend, that is loving the things of the world, is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The Word of God. Ephesians 5.11 do not participate in the worthless... Please read the, please read the caption. Godly character exposes darkness. What, I, what have I been talking about for the last year? Character. Okay. Just want to make sure. Ephesians 5.11. Do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. What's one of the ways that we expose them? by exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. And what? Godly character. Do you know when you are walking a walk that looks like Christ, that that's a testimony? Your character? Believe me, you might not think people see it, but they see it. They see your godly character or lack of it. And as you mature more and more in Christ, you begin to realize it too. Exactly what needs to go and what you need more of. And you're never content with where you're at. You're either going up or you're either going down. That's right. In development of your character. There's no plateau. Until we enter into glory. Then we'll be completely glorified. But now we're being sanctified. We're onions. You ever peel an onion? That's what we're doing. We're peeling our one layer after another layer after another layer. We're just a bunch of onions. Now that's yeah. some fragrance. <laughs> yeah, don't don't cut it because then you'll start to cry. Amen. but instead expose them by exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. 
You know it takes courage to stand for God's morals, for God's character. That there, we're going to talk about hate again. Well, you think you're so high and mighty. You don't do this, you don't do that. I hear you say this. You, you're, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Be heavenly minded. Stand, develop morals. Morals are based on your beliefs and your values. And that all comes from the new man, the new nature, that we're born again, that is engrafted into us. We have the sin nature and we have the God nature. The God nature is the identical nature of God. Because why? We're his kid. Amen. That's what, that's what it means. We've, we've been born from above. Not from below. God is our Father. We have His attributes when we become born again. It's there. Activate it. Use it. Grow in it. Go ahead. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things that such people practice in secret. Isn't, isn't that true? Oh, you ever boy. hear people start to talk about some stuff? And it's just like, ah, let me out of here. I don't want to hear all that. I don't want to be part of that. that. That's nasty. That's filthy. How can you derive any pleasure out of that? Because they're spiritually discerned. They cannot see the light. Go ahead. Verse 13, but all things become visible. When they are exposed by the light. How of many God. things? When they are exposed by the light. How many? All. Oh. Thank you. What is, whatever is done in darkness will eventually come into the light. Either in this life or later on. You can't get away with it. And but, so, understand that. Don't condemn yourself. You're a human being, and you fight just like everyone else against the sin nature. But don't, don't, don't derive your pleasure from it. It should cause you, every believer, it should cause them to feel godly sorrow. Because when you sin... You're sinning against the most holy God. Amen. Godly sorrow produces repentance. That's the right. The Bible says. You don't repent because you're doing... Let me see. How can I say it? You don't repent because you want to do what's right even though you do want to do what's right. But how can you repent without any godly sorrow? You're going to go right back to it. When I know I've hurt God and I've sinned against God, that, that harms my relationship with Him. I'm separated now. I, I don't want that anymore. I want to stay uptight all the time. I don't want any space or separation between us. So I'm going to readily uh, repent. How do you repent? I was wrong, God. I disobeyed you. I hurt you. I sinned against you. And I don't agree with that sin. I'm against that sin. As a matter of fact, I'm turning my back on it. And I'm walking away from that sin. And God, I'm not going to do it again. Please forgive me. Cleanse me with the blood of Christ. Because that's why he died. is for that. But don't forget. Or don't overlook. Repentance. You can't just sin and then ask for forgiveness and then go back to that sin. There's no repentance. Repentance produces godly sorrow, or godly sorrow re produces repentance. Without the godly sorrow, you're going to keep doing the sin.
But okay, all, I, guess, I guess God wants me to stay on this slide. I'm trying to. Did you finish it? 13. But all things become visible when they are exposed to the light of God's precepts. For it is light that makes everything visible. Okay. Maybe the batteries in this are dead or something. Could you could you advance this to the next slide? Go ahead, Miles. First Peter two nine, the title says, "We can be hated or loved because of our character." First Peter two nine, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people at what? all. Once you were not a people. That's right. This is so good. Continue. But now you are God's people. Yeah. Once you had not received mercy... But now you have received mercy. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world. What does that mean? How can you be an alien or a stranger in this world? Yeah, you're not part of it. Very simple. This is not our home. We're just passing through. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against the soul. Can I get an amen? Amen. Have you been in a war like that? Mm. Amen. Keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved Gentiles. Conduct yourself honorably with graciousness and integrity. And what? Integrity. Integrity. Remember that word. Integrity. So that, for whatever reason, they may slander you as evildoers. It'll happen. Yet, by observing your good deeds, uh -huh. they may instead come to glorify God. In Without the maintaining your integrity, that could never happen. Amen? Amen. That's the purpose. Just by living with integrity and character and godly character, that's a testimony to others. And that might be the very thing, even what's coming out their mouth might not be right. But the Spirit of God is working on them and opening up their eyes and they're seeing something and they'll hopefully get to a place to say, I, wanna, I want what you got. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to stand like that. I want to be able to receive all this slander and all this stuff that's coming at you. And look at you. You're full of joy. Nothing's affected you. How can you do that? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Come on. So that what, for whatever reason, they may slander you as evildoers, yet by observing your good deeds they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation when he looks upon them with mercy. Were you ever looked upon with mercy? Oh, boy. Honor God and maintain your integrity. I can't talk integrity. about integrity without bringing up Job 1.1. I think you guys have heard me speak about this before, but I'm going to do it again because it's powerful. Go ahead. Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless. He was what? Blameless. Say that. Blameless. Okay. And upright. Say that. Upright. Okay. That man was blameless and upright. One who feared God. Say that. One who feared God uh -huh. with reverence and abstained and turned away from evil. Say that again. He And abstained and turned away from evil. Some translation says shunned evil. Because he honored God. Because why? He honored God. Wow. I would say Job was in love with God. Mm-hmm. Okay, 1-9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, 
Does Job fear God for nothing? You guys all know the story about Job. I didn't put everything down, but um, does there anyone who doesn't know the story? Okay. I'll, I'll kind of hit on it by I get to the end of this. Go ahead. Have you not made a hedge around him? What is a hedge? It's a protective fence. Natural barrier. A barrier. Something that is around Job, and you cannot penetrate it. Have you ever seen a laurel hedge? Mm -hmm. One that's grown for years and years and got it all nice and trimmed. That's what I see in my mind. And it's so thick, there's no way you can penetrate through that thing. And it's 20 feet tall, and there ain't no way you can climb over it. This is Job. Job's got a hedge around him. Wherever he goes for protection, as it'll be evidence. Go ahead. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? So this hedge surrounded everything in Job's life. Everything. His family, his home, his possessions, wherever he went, God had him protected. From who? Satan. Yeah. You have what? well, What's so special about Job? I thought God showed no partiality. Why did Job have this hedge and I don't? He was. That's blatant. what I want you to ask yourself. Don't need to answer. Why does Job have this hedge and I don't? And furthermore, how can I get one? Would you like to have one like that? Uh-huh. Okay, let's see if God reveals that to us. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Okay, what's coming next? The Lord said to Satan, the Lord speaking here. Have you considered? This is the Lord's testimony about Job. And it's written in the Bible. How many people do you know that God had wrote their testimony in the Bible? There's only a few. Job's one of them. And this is God, the, the Lord, God above everything, is speaking to us this testimony about this man, Job. I want my daddy to talk to me, talk about me this way. I want, I want my father to speak my testimony. Oh, he's a drug addict and he hit the ground and he never did follow me. No, that's not what I want. I want my, I want you to look at my servant, Pastor James. There is none like him in the world. How would you like to have God say that about you? Uh-huh. That's what he's saying about Job. But why? Let's continue. Have you considered and reflected on my servant Job? For there is none like him wow. on the earth. Wow, on the earth. Not none, no one. He's the top of the heap, number one. But God's no part. God doesn't show partiality towards anybody. What is it that Put Job in this position. Go to Job 1.1. 1, 1. Before this scripture starts, God comes out and gives us. You, all you have to read is Job 1.1. 1, 1. You don't have to go any further. Job 1.1. 1, 1. Now there, just continue reading this all. All right. Because he, he repeats it. For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless a what? and up, blameless. Blameless. And upright. An upright. Man. One who fears God. Fears God. With reverence. Uh -huh. And abstains from and turns away from evil. Okay. Repeat after me. Blameless. Blameless. Upright. Upright. Fear God. Fear God. And shun evil. Shun evil. Remember those four. And I'll challenge you even further. Get into the Hebrew. And look up the meaning of all four of those words and see what God opens up to you about you and your character. Because this is his testimony about Job. And as a result of this testimony is the reason why he has a hedge. 
because he honors God. Go 1-1. One, one. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. He could have just stopped right there. He didn't have to add the rest of this. But the rest of this is for us. And that, that he was blameless and upright and feared God and shunned evil. Job 1-1. One, one. Just stay in that verse and look up those words. And because he was living in this manner, God had this hedge of protection around him and his family and his household and all of his possessions and everything. And, and the evil one could not touch him unless God gave him permission. Go ahead, finish it up. And turns away from evil because he honors God and still maintains and holds tightly to his integrity. To his what? Integrity. Now that's, that's added on. God just added on to the testimony. And he, and he still maintains and holds tightly to his integrity. When you go through trials and tribulations and tests, pain and suffering and the hate of the world is coming against you, and it seems like everything is collapsing on you, and the devil's telling you, shut up and curse God. He doesn't love you. Turn your back on him and fall away. Job said, naked I came into the world, naked I'll leave. Glory and honor to God forever. Amen. I will never turn my back on Christ, no matter what. And holds tightly to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. And why do we sin? Daniel, tell us. Yeah, we sin because we're not willing to suffer. Bottom line, selfish and self-centered. We give in to sin because our flesh wants it. Our sinful nature wants it. And if we say no to our sinful nature, guess what? The sinful nature is going to start to whine and cry. Give it to me. Give it to me. Do this. It'll feel so good. Blah, 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 blah. I really want this. Holy Spirit is saying no. Suffer. Suffer through that. Why? Here it is. Are you prepared? 1 Timothy 4.1 Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh and died for us, arm yourself like warriors. Are you armed? What does being armed mean? A warrior doesn't go to battle without being armed. If sin is going to come against you, you have to be prepared. If you're going to go to a war and you're going to go to fight a battle, whatever, you can't enter that battle without being prepared. Every day of our life is a battle. Every day of our life, we live it as a warrior. And many of us get um, hijacked because we decide we want to take the ease of things. Okay, been there, done that. I'm just teaching. I'm not putting myself above anyone, believe me. But I want to help. The Holy Spirit wants to help us to see something. Because there is no one in the world, whether of the enemy or of God, that will ever make you sin. It's your own free will. You have the choice. You know what to do. Well, what do I do, Pastor James, to stop sinning? Say no. No, I'm not going to do that. Flesh, shut up. Get under my feet and die. Because you're, you're trying to kill me. And I'm going to kill you. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to go to that website. No, I'm not going to go to that bar. No, I'm not going to call that girl. No, I'm not going to call that guy. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. Die, flesh. But, but, it, shut up. I love you, Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. I love your integrity. 
You're not willing to commit adultery. You're not willing to do the things of the world. You're willing to keep your vow to me because I love you. Yes, you do, Lord, and I'm so grateful, and I love you. Boom, you get the Spirit all over you, and you get raised up in power and strength, and then God puts you to work and starts using you, and you experience joy like you've never experienced before. Amen. That's what true joy is, is walking in the thing, in the place that God created you to do. No drug, no alcohol, no woman, no man, no money, no nothing can bring the joy that comes to us for doing the things for God that he created us to do. And when you're in that place, you'll know it. And sin comes knocking at your door, you know what you say? <laughs> Why would I trade this for that? Go ahead, brother. Arm yourselves like warriors with the same purpose, being willing to suffer for doing what's right. There you and go. Pleasing God. There you go. Because whoever has suffered in the flesh. Wait a minute. Whoever? Whoever has who, suffered. Who is whoever? Us. Okay. Whoever has suffered in the flesh, being like-minded with Christ. Being it, just like Christ. Being like-minded. Being in agreement with him. Is done with intentional sin. Hello. You Happy. want to be done with it? Suffer. In the flesh. And get built up in the spirit. Let your flesh scream and whine and cry. You little baby, shut up. I'm a man of God. I serve God. And I walk with integrity and moral courage and godly character. I'm not trading that for anything. I've been there, done that. You got nothing new for me except the, the desire to continue to take my life and ruin everything. I ain't going for it. No. Go ahead. Is done with intentional sin. Having stopped pleasing the world so that he can no longer spend the rest of of his natural life living for human appetites and desires. That's right. But lives for the will and the purpose of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's my, that's my desire. That's my dream. To live for the will and the purpose of God. Woohoo! Not to spend the rest of my natural life living for human appetites. I'm just passing through. Someday I'll have just a spiritual body. Not to worry about this human stuff, fleshly stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to skip that last slide because I'm so sorry I, I ran over. But what I did is I put, put down four points for us to notate called overcoming the hate of the world. Because you know what? The hate of the world is going to come against us. And it's going to try to take us from our faith. Number one. Brother Miles, number one. Be prepared. Arm yourself by being willing to suffer for the sake of Christ. That's first, it. For first the Peter sake of Christ. That's the motivation of our willingness to suffer. For his sake. Go ahead. Two, be consecrated to Christ. Keep your vow. Yes. We're not adulterers. Excuse me, we're not adulteresses. Amen? Amen. I'm keeping my vow. I'm keeping myself sanctified and set apart for him. Use me, God. I ain't going to dabble in the world. Number three. Honor God by keeping your integrity, godly character. I think for the rest of my life, every day I'm before you all, I'm going to have to talk about godly character. <laughs> I just feel like that is so, so important. It's what the whole Bible is about. Can't lose sight. We always want to work on our character. It's never good. We're just pe keep peeling that onion. Amen? Amen. Okay, and number four? Maintain your love relationships with God and God's people. Amen? Amen. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you for teaching us in your word. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that we receive this word in such a way that will continue to grow to bring you glory and honor. And we love you. And I ask you just to bless the people now as we depart and that you would be well pleased with our fellowship, our conversations, and our behaviors. Thank you for bringing a brother Francis to us. It was such a wonderful thing to have you here. And uh, just bless your people today, God, as we fellowship in your name. Let the love of God be bountiful. Let it be multiplied among us. May we be well, well pleasing in your sight. Lord, I, pr I pray that every single person comes to a, a full understanding of blameless, of walking upright, of um, fearing God and shunning evil so that we come before you in such a way, Lord, as Job, that you would be well pleased and we would bless you and that we would hold on to our integrity no matter what comes up against us in this world. No matter what the world says about us or does to us, we're not bowing a knee to anything but to you. In Jesus' name I pray. If there's anyone that doesn't know Christ, anyone that doesn't, that thinks that they're not born again or knows that they're not born again, now's your chance. We can get you there. We can get you there. Nothing's too difficult for God. It doesn't matter what kind of a sinner we were or are. Nothing's too big for God. It doesn't matter. What matters to Him is whether or not you receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior. If there's anyone, come on up. And if you don't want to come up now, come up later. At any time. Or call me. Or look at your brother or sister next to you and talk to them about it. We all need to get saved. It has to happen. Eternal separation from God. We're just, we're just passing through. We're, we're at the end of the end time. The rapture could be at any time. Any time. There's nothing that has to happen according to the Bible, that the rapture is here. We know the tribulation period is coming. We see it. You talk to Christians today, they see it. You talk to unbelievers, they see it. Things are changing. Get right with God. Use the time. Redeem the Redeem your time, for the days are evil. Anyway, bless you all, and uh, I'll stand up here and pray for anyone that wants prayer. Um, you're dismissed. Amen.